So you might remember Dr. Rachel Wheeler, who um, uh, visited our class earlier in the semester, um, uh, a week or two after spring break, to talk about her studies uh, in Christian spirituality, um, her studies in echo spirituality. Um, and so, yeah, um, she uh, and I were at uh, Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California together. Um, she contacted me um, within the last year about uh, making a contribution to a book that she is putting together about spirituality and animals. Um, and so for me, um, it's like, well, I haven't really done much studies in animals, um, but I immediately realized that um, I could um, write something about Fritz Eichenberg, uh, and I will show soon um, that Fritz Eichenberg, the animals is a very, a very big theme, uh, recurring theme in the art of Fritz Eichenberg. So that is basically what I'm working on, is something that is uh, on the topic of spirituality and animals in the art of Fritz Eichenberg. Reading that I posted um, from a book called Fallen Animals, Art, Religion, and Literature, um, edited by Diane Apostolos Capadona, and Zohar Hadromi Alushi. Um, I have actually seen Diane Apostolos Capadona speak before and um, know that she is very much uh, highly regarded um, in the area of art and religion. Um, some of what they were saying in this article is um, uh, animals may be seen as untouched by the fall or hampered by fallen humanity. I don't know if that is really very well phrased, um, but I think what they're basically saying is um, that somehow animals are also impacted by the fall. When you see the fall capitalized there, this is the fall of Adam and Eve. Um, and so think what they're trying to say, hampered, I don't know, that seems like a word that's not as commonly used, but um, they might be saying animals are either um, separate from the fall of humanity, um, of the fall of Adam and Eve in the first uh, three chapters of Genesis, or either separate from that or somehow included in that. Uh, I think raising questions of, um, are animals sinful? Um, you know, um, you know, are they tainted by sin? Maybe that might be another way of putting it. Um, uh, do animals sin? Um, these kinds of things. So I um, think now um, something that you will see on YouTube, I think, um, goes far beyond what you might see on TV as far as graphics when it comes to um, animals um, in nature um, attacking each other. Um, so you can really see some brutal, brutal depictions of animals um, in their natural element. And at the same time, it's like, well, that's, that's animals. I mean, that's what they do. It's not like they're it's not like an act of murder or something that's, they don't really have that kind of um, mentality. I think that's maybe something of what they're trying to uh, convey here. I thought it was very interesting how they listed uh, a, a long history of books that would describe um, animals with human characteristics, values, and ideas such as power, wisdom, and courage, and so forth in um, a variety of books. Um, and then the um, reading uh, mentions a few coming more into modern culture, um, such as Black Beauty, um, which I think uh, a story 
dates back even to like the 19th century, at least in its book, and then various um, books and movies over time, um, or Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> Um, and so uh, you saw in the reading there, they were kind of elaborating on the ways that um, animals continue to be depicted um, and certain characteristics of animals that kind of play into like the values or the kind of characters that they depict. Here is some of the ways that uh, Fritz Eichenberg has included animals in his art. Um, so first is kind of an overview and then there's certain aspects that I'll... Um, so this is also, as I mentioned, um, something that I'm working on uh, for uh, the book that Rachel is putting together. Um, and I'm not really actually sure yet what direction I'm gonna go in. So this kind of just basically a work in progress. But um, yeah, Fritz Eichenberg definitely included a lot of depictions of animals in his art. Um, he did also, he did book illustration and in some ways um, sometimes illustrated children's books. Um, so this is uh, to his son, Tim, uh, that he includes there. Um, this is not his typical style. This is more of a drawing style, whereas, um, you know, he would do woodblock printing. Um, so yeah, um, the ape in a cape is this one. Uh -huh. uh, carp with a harp. Um, okay. Um, a book by Goethe, Reynard the Fox. I'm not familiar with the, the story, but there is, uh, uh, this is one of the works that he illustrated. Uh, I couldn't find um, a good example of another book that he illustrated related to animals, but he did uh, illustrations for Puss in Boots. Um, so, but I wasn't able to find a good uh, picture of that. Uh, um, I think this is getting uh, a little bit more into overlapping with Eichenberg's uh, spirituality um, is in his, um, even before he became Quaker, um, he was very fascinated with St. Francis of Assisi, who is also very, very well known for um, being a friend of animals. And so this is a, uh, a print of Francis of Assisi um, with a variety of animals, a rhinoceros, a lion, a zebra, monkeys, walrus, I think, um, elephant. I think this is like a weasel on St. Francis's head, moose. Um, so when Fritz Eichenberg was depicting animals in his images, he would also depict a lot of animals that might not be more commonly included in um, uh, depictions. And um, you can tell that he was very much a close observer of animals. Um, uh, and that's one example, um, his image of, and he did a variety of different images of Francis of Assisi. Um, now, another major event, um, getting back into the idea of a, a case study as a biography, is that um, Fritz Eichenberg and his family moved to the U.S. Uh, in 1933. A few years later, his wife suddenly became ill, rushed to the hospital, and died on the operating uh, room table. Um, and so very sudden, tragic, um, I think uh, Mary Eichenberg was a year younger than Fritz Eichenberg, so she was in her mid-30s, um, and he went into period of mourning and depression and spiritual searching, which led him to uh, affiliate with the Society of Friends, known as the Quakers. Um, and here then, I also point to 
uh, a, um, an artist um, who was a Quaker, Edward Hicks, um, known as someone who painted over a hundred variations of the peaceable kingdom uh, image. This is just one of Edward Hicks's depictions of the peaceable kingdom. And that comes from uh, Isaiah 11, um, talking about kind of a, like a messianic biblical passage, um, uh, the shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse. Christians would interpret this as referring to Jesus. Um, although Isaiah um, comes from the Hebrew Bible, and so uh, Jews would not interpret this that way, but um, uh, the idea of the Messiah is also that um, there is a future peaceable kingdom when the wolf is the guest of the lamb, the leopard lies down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion browse together with a child to guide them. The cow and the bear shall graze together. Their young shall lie down. The lion shall eat hay like the ox. The baby shall play in the viper's den. The child lay his hand on the adder's lair. So this is just a vision of a uh, peaceable kingdom. Here is Fritz Eichenberg's variation on that, where animals, um, both carnivores and herbivores, are together. Um, uh, and the baby is playing with a snake. Um, here you see, again, a wide variety of various animals depicted. Um, that is one. Um, and also Fritz Eichenberg um, this was 1979, um, uh, released his own book. Uh, so there were times where he, certainly most of what he did was illustrating books uh, that were classic works of literature written by some of the greatest authors uh, in history. But um, in his later years, he um, issued a few books where he provided illustrations along with his own text, um, such as this for um, endangered species and other fables with a twist. Um, here is um, another kind of a variegation on the peaceable kingdom. One of those kinds of illustrations where you look at it and um, it is depicting the head of a man. Um, but you can also see that it's made up of animals. Um, and if you look closely, you see there again, the child playing with the snake. Um, so I think definitely the peaceable kingdom is that kind of very um, optimistic vision of animals um, carnivores are going to be with uh, herbivores and they're not going to eat them. So that kind of optimistic idea of the virtue of animals. Fritz Eichenberg in the Endangered Species and Fables with a Twist. Um, here I will show a few other examples where um, Fritz Eichenberg is not afraid at all to depict the dark side of animals. Um, uh, you know, and he, I think um, he definitely is using animals in ways that, um, you know, he is kind of struggling with the idea of the peaceable kingdom as being overly optimistic, naive. Um, so this is an image, total disarmament, with the lamb here um, is the chairperson. And yeah, various carnivores, alligator, um, cats, like a panther, a lion, a tiger, um, snake, um, wolf, bear, and so forth. Here's what Eichenberg adds to that. Um, 
Chairperson Lamb presiding meek as ever at the last session of the Animals United Historic Conference on Peace on Earth, Total Disarmament. This is an epic making moment, says the Lamb. These talks began 500 years ago when our ancestors decided wisely so to do away with all aggressive weapons. The time has come to put the final seal and signature on our solemn pact, never again to use fangs, teeth, or claws on our brethren, be they weak or strong. How many of these weapons we may need for sustenance of life and its defense have been discussed at length for many years. The killing has to stop, the weapons have to go, and peace will reign supreme in all the world. I'll put it to a vote. All those in favor, all hell broke loose, no one to count the votes. But the surviving council members all agreed. They never feasted on a more delicious lunch of leg of lamb and tender mutton chops than at that last and definitely final session. So, um, right uh, here, I think you can see Fritz Eichenberg, um, is um, definitely uh, expressing his fear of um, uh, the nature of humanity reflected in the nature of animals, that these animals um, can't help but eat the lamb. And um, so I think, um, uh, when it comes to the idea of peace on earth, disarmament, Fritz Eichenberg is also um, depicting his, his fears um, uh, about actual feasibility of these things. Here's another image from Endangered Species. Um, this is the dove and the hawk. Now here, um, we'll kind of flip back the other way around <clears throat> with something <clears throat> more hopeful. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> the fearful hawk, not having heard of that old kingdom, Pax Vobiscum, has ruled the skies for centuries with great impunity. He had license to hunt pigeons since time began. What fun, they always turn the other cheek. Until the day, to his surprise, the hawk met Superdove. She'd heard of Joan of Arc, dive-bombed the mighty bird, and won the fight and immortality. Um, so uh, the image of the dove and the hawk there, um, typically um, dove and hawks are um, even today kind of used to refer to a hawk is someone who wants to go to war and a dove is typically depicted as a symbol of peace. So obviously a hawk is the more powerful bird of prey. Uh, and um, uh, here Eichenberg is kind of flipping that script uh, that the dove will overpower the hawk. Um, okay, so 